Happy Friday, great show for you today. Happy to have Super Bowl champion, yay, Andrew Whitworth joining us. And we're gonna talk about that hoodie blazer combo. Oh yes, we will, and break down Baker Mayfield's debut. Unbelievable Rams comeback win last night. We also will get you ready for the weekend slate of action and a weekly visit from PFF Sam Munson. I don't have beer here in the New York studio, but our show starts now. Welcome to Up and Adams in New York City. That's right, that's fake. That's a green screen right there. I'm in New York and I'm about to have a great weekend. Uh, oh, Richard Issacaz in my ear saying, no, don't tell them. But it looks pretty good, huh? I kind of wanted to wear a green turtleneck, so I was just a floating hat, head and some hands out here today on a Friday. But listen, this isn't about me. This is about Baker Mayfield. Second day is a ramp. Second day, he gets there and then he leads LA to an absurd comeback win, marching. 98 yards, final drive, check this out. Oh my gosh, there was a minute and 35 left. Uh, what? Rams fans everywhere freaking out. This is highlighted by an absolute dime to Van Jefferson. Oh, <laughs> game winner. And if there's one thing you can say about Baker, he has a flair for the dramatic. And after a wild one like this, I had to bring in someone who was there in the action last night. So excited and very grateful to be joined by an NFL vet of 16 years playing offensive tackle for the Bengals and the Rams wearing the hoodie. You were at the Rams and Raiders last night as part of Amazon Prime's incredible Thursday night football coverage, Super Bowl champion, <gasps> Andrew Whitworth. Hi. What's going on? Good morning. What a Friday. What a Thursday night, Baker Mayfield. <laughs> it was unbelievable. And I forgot to mention Walter Payton, Man of the Year. Of course, we have to talk about that with the Rams, and you had a big part in that. But let's go to SoFi Stadium. You're there. You, you know, you played your games as a Ram, uh, their, uh, your home turf there. You won a Super Bowl for that stadium, for that squad. What was that moment like for you last night? It was really cool to be back in SoFi. You know, the travel schedule was doing Thursday night. You're kind of all over the place. But to get to be home for a week and enjoy being in SoFi and uh, seeing what Rams fans were there. There were a lot of Raider fans there. Uh, but getting to see the fans <laughs> and, and be in that element was a lot of fun. And then, man, just uh, uh, an ending nobody could have predicted. What a night. Really special for that team. Uh, my favorite image of the night was Sean McVay after that score. Just, you know, sitting there going crazy. I was like, man, you could have just – took that image, put it with the Super Bowl game, and thought they won one right there. Uh, you can tell that team needed a W, and uh, there was a lot of emotion that came out in that moment. It's so true, and you were I loved seeing you. You were out there celebrating with some of those it guys. It was great. Uh, yeah, it kind of looked like you were still part of the team there, Andrew. Well, you know, you got to think. I mean, a lot of those guys are young young guys that uh, I've had a chance to be there for, a mentor, and over this year and even the years past when I was there. So they mean a lot to me. And see, seeing a Ben Skronik, uh make the plays he made there at the end, uh, you know, just such a competitor, a great kid. Uh, we've always had a great rapport, so I'm so proud of him. And then, you know, you didn't even really get a chance to talk about it because of the moment, but that's a good rushing group with Max Crosby and Chandler Jones and those guys. And, and that line's all oh, yeah. beat up to, to find a way in two minutes to, to keep the quarterback up and, and to get down the field. Uh, man, happy for those guys as well. It's been a tough year for them. They've heard their name in a, in a bad way for a long time. So I'm sure everyone on that roster and in that organization uh, woke up on this Friday just a little bit happier. It's so true. And Whitworth, I'm a, a little happier this morning uh, that you it said that you did not see the Baker thing coming because I certainly feel better knowing that you, a Super Bowl champion with the squad, also were in the same boat as I. He gets to L.A. on Tuesday. He takes 95 percent of the snaps um, at quarterback. I'm trying to look at where I'm at here on Thursday night. Right. Leads the Rams this miracle win. It was insane to, for me to even just have him on the field uh, after being there for just two days in the area. I still, still can't believe he pulled it off. So to you, what sort of stood out? from his performance yeah I think you really look at it he looked calm and poised and, and you touched on it he kind of seems to love these kind of moments when people count him out and it only it's almost like he performs better when things are really bad around him and people are saying things about him than when you know people are praising him and, and bringing him up and saying what a good player he could have the chance to be so I thought it was really what a performance by him I mean it, you can't say enough great things for that kind of commitment but also Sean McVay I mean you know, with our relationship, I've known for, for the last four or five years when we talked about different quarterbacks across the league, Sean has always loved Baker. They shared a flight together one time out to the draft. 
and yeah. uh, had a great talk. And, and Sean always brings that up when, when we would talk about QBs that he just loved his, his really his confidence, his charisma, kind of who he is. And so I think um, he was probably pretty excited when, you know, considering their situation, a quarterback and things that have gone on when Baker became available. I think that really is a chance that he's always wanted to be around him and just kind of get a feel for what he was really like on the field together. So I think that uh, it's something that really has kind of juiced up Sean a little bit in a season that seems a little lost. And then you have Matthew Stafford, a consummate pro, uh, somebody who's obviously going to be there for Baker Mayfield to finish off this season. But with everything going on with Matthew Stafford being shut down, the elbow injury to add to all the other things and a long list of stuff that wasn't going to cut his 14th season short. uh, How much of what's going on right now in the locker room in that front office is an audition for Baker Mayfield to keep this gig? Well, I think you really look at it. I mean, it's a win-win for the Rams because the only thing that could really happen from this is if Baker plays out the rest of the year. And that's why I kind of said last night, you saw him out there in pregame taking snaps to the starting center. Yesterday, just being around, it sure seemed like they were going to put him in the game at some point. For them, if he plays really well and leaves, you know, there's a chance to get some, you know, compensatory pick stuff back. And then if he, you know, what shows enough to be a backup and just wants to take that role – that's a win, too, for the Rams. So I think that the opportunity, and for Baker, too, to show himself as, hey, I can play well enough to maybe get another starting opportunity. So I think for everybody, it's really a great opportunity, you know, for to go forward, see what you can do, bring a little life to the team, and uh, see if they can turn things around and end this season on a much higher note than what it started. That's a good, me- good, well, well-versed well media answer. Not giving any info on Steph Stafford or what might be the future here. Wishing him the best in his recovery, of course. I'll say this. Baker Mayfield might have a future, but not if he does this. This is the second, Andrew. This is the second time this season that we, come on. This is, what you know, is he doing? Here, here's the thing, Kate. I'm a head butter too, so I got, you know, I... It's just some of us aren't good with our arms in the moment, okay? You know, you, you want to high five and you want a chest bump and you get lost in the moment and you just go head first, you know? So, uh, hey, he'll be okay. And look, you know, as for Stafford, that guy's going to be there. He's going to be playing football. Stafford's ready. He, he'll be fine. He's, he's a little banged up. Okay, you're but, a head uh, He'll be healthy. Okay? You're so you ain't right, got to so worry so about Baker, Stafford. I'm not worried about him. Okay. As a, as a head butter. Are you feeling that today? Is Baker feeling that today? Um, you know, you might have a little sore. Like, for me, having no hair, it's, it's dangerous. Because, you know, I can end up with a purple mark, a cut. I've done it before. It's happened. You know, the kids are like, what's wrong with you? I thought you wore a helmet. But, uh, you know, it happens. You know, some of us, like I said, we're just, we lean in with the head a little too much when we get excited. And uh, go head first. It, you know, he'll be all right. I, I mean, I, I guess that he's, head right he's, really, he's really taking that I'm a ram personally he's truly ram yeah i like like what you did there i like what you did there it all makes sense uh andrew i like what you do with your wardrobe because listen a lot of people are talking about baker mayfield but literally everyone and you're smiling is talking about the hoodie blazer combo okay everyone is and you know you're an icon when people are loving emulating obsessing over what you wear how did this look come together and what do you make of all the buzz you know, honestly, I, I think I was just, uh, you know, one of the preseason just hanging out with some of the Amazon team and, and uh, talking about wardrobe and those kind of things. And we wanted to make sure really with us that, you know, it was it was more edgy and it was more just us being ourselves. And I wear a hoodie with like a, a you know, a jacket, not necessarily a sports coat, but like different jackets and stuff. It's just kind of a look I like. And I'm always wearing a hoodie, working out, doing everything. So uh, we went to dinner. They saw it. And they're like, dude, that's kind of your look. Why don't you just wear it? And I was like, hey, if you guys uh, – you know, are willing to be on board with that, I'm in. So don't tempt me with a good time. So I've been wearing it. It's been great. You know, it's, it's been a lot of fun. I get feedback. It's, I always love, like, Twitter. It's like one way or the other, right? I mean, either some fans just hate it, and it's like, you know, you're destroying the game. You should have a collared shirt on and a tie or something. <laughs> or somebody loves the look, you know? So it's really fun. I get everything from who, who makes the hoodies and, like, where can I find one to uh, you're ruining football because you have a hoodie on on TV. Oh, I think you need to call Michael Rubin up at Fanatics and say, 
I we I mean it's so polarizing and it's all over. It's what anybody's commenting on if you search on Twitter for Thursday Night Football. Uh, you can call Michael Rubin over at Fanatics and NFL Shop and get yourself a line of Andrew Whitworth hoodie. Like maybe it's like a hoodie that's with a. Bl- so there's something there. I'm just trying to make oh, you yeah. know you and your beautiful Kevin, family some Kevin money. Kevin Demoff last night, the team president for the Rams. He he did a tribute to me. Wore the hoodie jacket. So uh, he was so excited. He texted me. He's like, I can't wait for you to see me. I'm honoring you tonight, and it's not your jersey. So when I saw him last night, it was funny. Uh, really <laughs> cool to see. And it should be. Uh, you should be honored, especially in that building. I mean, you played 16 years in the NFL, 16 years. This is your first year in streaming, I'll say. Uh, not television, but in broadcasting, we'll put it, right? Um, what has surprised you the most about how the game is covered and what this side of the business is? You know, I, for me, it's really been, uh, I, I didn't realize how much fun I would have. I mean, just being around people and I think being a football player and especially an O-lineman, you don't really get involved a lot in the media side. You know, I think that's what's really cool about being in this position. And I don't take it lightly is that, you know what, I want to see more offensive linemen have an opportunity to, to be themselves and share their voice. You see what Jason Kelsey's really been able to do with his podcast with Travis. Yeah. I mean, just you, you see more guys getting in that space and being comfortable because I think as old linemen, you, you've always been kind of taught, be quiet, you know, don't say a word, um, just go do your job, protect the quarterback and help the running back get yards. And, uh, you know, you're only going to get like, talked about or even brought up if you get a holding call or mess up most of the time. So mm-hmm. I think now to be in this space and realize how much fun it is and what an opportunity to go be yourself and talk about the game you love and, you know, everyone in that space, the game of football has changed their life in some way, form or fashion. So uh, that part has been really fun. I don't think I've ever been so excited to watch football on Sundays, Mondays and Thursdays every week. Uh, it, it's it's really been something I didn't realize how much fun it would be and how many cool people I've met along the way. I've, re- I've really appreciated the opportunity. It's incredible. I was talking to Taylor Lewan yesterday, and he's at this pivotal point in his career where he's deciding what he should do, and he's got the injuries and likely to be released by the Titans or at least restructured. That would be the improbable solution. And he he had a a, a cute emotional moment on the show where he said, he does the podcast with Will Compton, of course, and he said, it's so rewarding to make people's day, to hear from people. And similar to you talking about hearing feedback about your hoodie or people being interested in where you got it and all of that, it's a totally different side. And uh, I have connected it might be about the offensive lineman and the identity and what you're sort of conditioned to do in that position. And now you're part of Amazon's family, a super successful swing, at, swing, swing for the fences uh, season with the broadcasting. Who's the class, ca- class clown on the Amazon um, broadcast. Oh, I mean, we, it's easy, the beard. I mean, Ryan Fitzpatrick, uh, Ryan Fitzmagic, whatever you want to call him, uh, he's always got a one-liner. You know, that Harvard education comes out quick. He's so witty. He's so intelligent. Uh, he, he's really good at lightening the group up or having something that's maybe borderline, you know, hey, it's kind of personal, but it's also really funny. So he, he's just so good at playing that line. And you brought up Taylor Lewan. I think this is a key thing. I can remember before Taylor started the podcast, did all that stuff, he went on after his rookie year on the NFL Network and was on the draft, pro, you know, the uh, combine, actually, excuse me, coverage. And I can remember guys across the league, offensive linemen, mad that a young guy like that would go on TV and be out there talking about other O-linemen that are coming out the next year because what have you really done? Why are you speaking? And, and it's really the first time, to my point about O-linemen being involved in this media, that I realized we have a, a systemic problem with O-linemen. Like, what are we doing? Like, we should be celebrating a guy being on TV, getting an opportunity to talk what we know about and what our part in the game is. And I really give credit to him as being one of the first guys that necessarily, not, not that other O-linemen haven't done it, but really jumped yeah. out there and just showed his personality and rocked who he is and said, love me, hate me, whatever you want. This is who I am. Embrace it. And I think that's really cool that he kind of has been that guy that's really in this modern era of media exploding. He's been the guy that's kind of set the tone. It's true. I think that he and Will Compton, and he had to be sold on the concept by Will. He didn't want to do it. He said, nobody's doing a podcast. Then they started it, uh, Bussin' with the Boys, of course. And uh, and now you do have the Kelseys, Jason Kelsey. I mean, they're, I do believe, the number one sports podcast out there. I thought it was super cool that Taylor told me that he isn't 
I said, that's competition. Like you were the first, but they're having a little bit more success than you. And he said, I just love it all. Any player yep. taking the media into their own hands and you know using their voice and having success sort of makes him happy because he has the same thing of you. I want to see more of this. I want to encourage more of it. So that brings me, and I think every fan's asking, where is the Andrew Whitworth, Eric Weddle podcast? And maybe we can have special guest appearances by Ryan Fitzpatrick. Who knows? I mean, you, you're kidding me. I mean, me and the, me and the beard, the other beard, Eric Weddle need to. Well, you need it. I mean, it's got to happen. I mean, it got to happen. The the I call us uh, the Mean Girls because you know it's it's what you do in the locker room. The veterans who just we have the special place we sit. You can't sit at our lunch table. You can't sit on the training tables that we like to sit on. If we want to get taped, you have to move. You know, it's just constantly we wear pink on Tuesdays. It's it, you know it's the whole deal. So it, it, it it's who's all the, that. So me and Weddle, we got to get George? together. We got to make it happen. Who's the mean girl? Who's the Regina George, the leader of the mean girls? Oh, it's Weddle, for sure. I mean, you know, hey, look, yeah, Weddle loves giving people a hard time. That's his thing. You don't ever want to show Weddle a weakness because just like Ron Fitzpatrick, he's really good at just uh, continuing the needle. The thing that you show him will get a little emotion out of you. He's going to keep on poking at it. Eric Weddle, you can't sit with us. I can't imagine. Now, you, you, you wouldn't be that guy. You're the nice one that wants to make everyone happy because that's just who you are. You are a reigning Walter Payton NFL Man of the Year. And this week, you played a big role, surprising Rams offensive lineman Tremaine Ankrum and telling him that he is, in fact, the Rams Walter Payton Man of the Year nominee. Andrew, what did that mean to you? And what can you tell us about him? You know, it was really special. I mean, obviously going through the process, uh, you know, being a nominee over the years, I think five times, six times through my career, and then winning Walter Payton Man of the Year, unbelievable and something I'll never forget. But I actually, in that video, I don't know if it came out audio-wise as good because I actually got emotional when I was about to present it to him because I mm. thought about really the legacy and that, that that really, that award's about. It's not just about the guy who wins it. It's about really bringing light to all the things that guys do all across this league. I mean, we have a great league. It's a great sport. It's the greatest reality TV in the world. But we also have some really great people that, that devote their time and their energy and their effort to making things, you know, about less just about them and, and about the people around them and the communities that we get to play in, live in, and, and have an opportunity to be a part of. And so Tremaine Ankrum is one of those key parts to me because here's a guy that the reason the Rams found out that he would be a nominee is that somebody actually tipped them off how much service work he does without telling a soul. Mm. He was driving from practices and workouts to go visit Boys and Girls Clubs, Food Coalition, Salvation Armies, different things, going to make visits and see people it, nobody had an idea about tutoring boys and girls clubs, kids on his own. I mean, all these things that he didn't want any recognition, but he was already doing it. And so they started, they actually just started following him to document all the work he does. So I think to me, when you talk about all the different ways you can invest in your community, your service of your own hands and feet and time is, is one of the greatest ones that can possibly be. And because you'd say that your time is one of the most valuable things in the world. So I just think for him, it's so special, just the, the person he is. And I think I said that to him when I, I gave him the award to tell him he was our nominee is uh, just thank you for being exactly who you are. And thank you to the Rams for recognizing that and showing us all of that. And thank you for knowing so much. I don't know any of that uh, about Tremaine Ingram. And now I do. And he's one of the 32 nominees for the, mo the most prestigious award in the sport that we love so much. And speaking of doing good in the community, um, earlier this week, I bought a hoodie, okay, over at a place called whereimfrom.com. And there's a bit of a charity competition surrounding Joe Burrow and his foundation. So it's basically Bengals taking on LSU. It's that same do-good hoodie that you're seeing and you can either buy the Cincinnati Bengal colors or the LSU ones. Now you played for both. I'm going to need you. This might be the hardest thing you've done in a while. Who loves Joe Burrow more? If you're Andrew Whitworth, are you buying the Bengals colors jersey? Cincinnati loves him more or is it LSU and Baton Rouge? Oh man, you know what? Uh, in LSU and Baton Rouge, he can't do any wrong. That's for sure. But I'm going to go with the Bengals because I think that when you think about it, LSU had won some championships. They've had some success over the last 20 years. In Cincinnati, this guy walks in and in no time at all takes them to a Super Bowl. Even though they didn't win it, the, the opportunity to compete every year is something he's going to give them because he is a rare, rare human being. His ability to compete and make the guys around him better is, is so special. 
Uh, I'm, I'm a huge Joe Burrow fan. And so I, I can't wait to see how this season closes out. And I hope this opportunity he has here with the hoodies is great. But I'm still waiting on him to rock the hoodie. He promised me. I remember coming on with you when we were in Cincinnati. Okay. He promised me after the game, he saw the look and he said, dude, I kind of like it. I might actually try it out this year. So I'm still waiting. I check every week. I'm waiting to see the hoodie jacket. We're, it's going to happen. I can just feel it. One of these weeks, he's bringing it out. He's got to do the do good hoodie with the jacket uh, to Come support on. Andrew Whitworth. And Andrew Whitworth's new podcast, Whitworth and Weddle, You Can't Sit With Us. That's it. Boom. Thank you, Kay. I appreciate that. We're That's ready. It. I, I just uh, wrote I will it down. Say, we appreciate you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And I'll say, Joey Burrow might have not done it yet, but Matthew Hamilton, my producer here, take a look as we say bye to you, and we wish you a good happy look. It. He's, Thank he's you, got Matthew. it. I love it. You got to take you. the t-shirt off, I think. Uh, yeah? Is that the key? Yeah. You almost got a little turtleneck hoodie jacket thing going, but it's, it's cool. It's, you know, I, it's all right. I, all right. I'm just all right. All right. I'll, take it. I'll take it. <laughs> You can't sit with us, Hamilton. You can't sit with yeah. us. That's a mean girl. Right there. I'm, I'm not nice I'm all the time, Kay. Back on Up and Adams, the Bengals. Keep the energy, Hootay Nation. Show your stripes today and every day. Let's do it. Joe Burrow moved to 3-0 and against Patrick Mahomes last week. And yeah, I'm still talking about it because why wouldn't I? Uh, I will say this week, a little nervous. He has yet to solve the Cleveland Browns problem. He's 0 for an 0 for 4 uh, in his career. That's just not pretty. It's not what you want to see. Ugh. Passer rating, almost 15 points lower. What kind of kryptonite you guys dishing out there? Come on. Uh, 15 points lower than he is against the rest of the league, by the way. And he's been sacked more than four times per game in these previous four meetings. That is a capital W woof. Cleveland, of course, beat Cincy earlier this year on Monday Night Football. The score was 32 to 13. So I think it's time to bring on Matthew Hamilton for another edition of... Touch this. <laughs> touch this. I don't know what's more ridiculous, the dancing or the way that I look in this outfit. Uh, you know, Whitworth can pull it off. I'm not sure I can, but I'm uh, I'm sticking with it. Just, I, I, <laughs> Here's the deal. <laughs> you, okay, you got to break it all down for me because. Why have the Browns have had such an, I'm like literally my brain is going back and forth in my head. Why have the Browns had such a thing over Joe Burrow and what can he do on Sunday? Yeah, I think it all starts with controlling Miles Garrett. You showed it there. They've been having some issues keeping Burrow clean. Let's not forget that that last matchup was the Bengals' first game playing without Jamar Chase this season. And it took them a little bit to figure out how to get this offense clicking. But I think they've evolved. And you saw it last week with Jamar back in the fold now. I think this offense looks better than ever. So let's go to the tape and I'll show you why Jamar's presence in this offense makes them better. You'll see this is the first matchup against the Browns. It's a third and six. Without Jamar out there, they're playing press man across the board with just one safety over the top. And that allows them to bring pressure up front. They're sending five. And the Bengals just have a tough time picking this up. Nobody's able to get open across the board. And Burrow goes down very quickly. But with Chase back in the mix last week, this was that key play, that third and 11 to T. Higgins to ice the game. It's a simple slant flat concept. Chase running the slant at the bottom. Higgins running the slant up top. But I want you to watch how Kansas City defends this. Look at that. The safety has eyes on Chase Ooh. right off the snap. They're bracketing him. That means T. Higgins is one-on-one -on -one up top with rookie corner Joshua Williams. And Williams does a great job here. But without any help with Burrow's accuracy, Higgins' hands and ability to use his body, that's just impossible to defend no matter how mm. well you do it. And look at it from the end zone angle, you can really appreciate how incredible this throw is. I mean, William's hand is right there. He threads the needle. That's as tight a window as you can imagine, and Burrow fits it in there. But Chase's presence also allows for versatility in this offense. This was lost in the sad Kelsey shots on the sideline. The game-winning touchdown of Chris Evans. Watch how quickly the Bengals break the huddle here. Jamar Chase is at running back. Lines up in the backfield. The Chiefs are all sorts of confused. Chris Evans is up top running that shallow cross. He's lined up at wide yep. receiver. So... Casey's all over the place defensively. They actually pick up Chase defensive end. George Karloftis runs with him, but nobody runs with Evans. He is wide open in the middle of the field. 
The confusion that Chase being in the backfield created opens this up for the touchdown. And I think those four games that the Bengals played without Chase might have been the best thing for this offense because it allowed Burrow to develop that chemistry and rapport with these other weapons and the trust factor to go to them in these key situations. You saw it. The two key moments in the game, it's Chris Evans and it's Higgins that he goes to. Not saying that Chase won't have his opportunities to make plays in key situations, but knowing that he doesn't have to force the ball there and can spread it around makes this offense so much better. You make this show so uh, – the way you just explained that and showed that is really incredible. That was your best Hammer Time breakdown. And I know that I joke and I dance and stuff. Like, that was so well done by you. And if I was Nate Burleson, I would make some sort of Chris Evans Marvel Captain America joke, but I'm not going to do it. But you know Nate would, right? Oh, 100%. He would have been He would have been sitting at home last night with, the, with his feather pen from Nate Stradamus just <laughs> cooking up all the Captain America references he could. <laughs> And you love to see it. Now, Hammer, give me some faith here. Can the Bengals get it done on Sunday? I think they do. I think Burrow finally picks up that first win. They're five and a half point favorites. I think they cover that. Mm -hmm. And I think they hit that over for the 46 and a half point total. I think this offense is going to continue to explode. Uh, As good as that Browns pass rush is, you can't really bring pressure like we saw in that first game around when Chase is out there because this this offense is too talented. There are too many weapons that can make game-breaking plays. So it's going to be interesting. If the Browns want to play that aggressively again, I think the Bengals are going to take advantage of it. I hope so. Do we need the Bengals to have more uh, dynamic, ballsy play calling in this one? (laughs) I think it definitely helps when Zach Taylor stays aggressive. We saw him kind of shy away at points in that game, but when the game was on the line, that play to Higgins was as an aggressive call as you can make, and you saw how it paid off. I like when he trusts this offense and trusts Burrow in those in those big moments. Don't look at me like no I can't say goals. ballsy. Kyle, Sh- <laughs> Kyle Shanahan said it, so I can say it. It's now in the common nomenclature of NFL vernacular, No. Yeah, I'm I'm all for it. Just we don't need to dig into Brock Purdy's nickname, but we can go there with what Shannon no, has said for sure. That, but I will say I will say to you, I will say to you, uh, we have don't go to break yet, but we have Sam Munson on after this, and I will I do not have a beer here in studio. I thought you might come down and bring me one, since you're like. 11 miles for me, but you decided not to. That said, I couldn't have a beer because I told you right before the show, you couldn't get a hold of me. Um, I was, I had, I was under laughing gas until like three minutes until we came on air. And so that's, those are the kind of risky ballsy decisions I need Zach Taylor to make out there. Go get a couple of moles removed after a cancer check and get your, you know, laughing gas and then come do a national show. Some call it ballsy. Others would call it unhinged. I, I'm, I'm not one to say. You can make up your own mind on that. But uh, yeah, I trust. I trust myself. I trust myself. There we go. Give me the ball. Give me the ball, coach. All right, uh, Hamilton, that was an excellent hammer time. We'll put that up on Twitter, and you guys can follow Mr. Hamilton, uh, who's, who looks like he's wearing a turtleneck. I know what you're here for, DFUs. Options, let's look at your lineups for fantasy. The first player, Tyler Huntley, seven grand. I like the running upside, you always like that. Icing on the cake, get a good bang for your buck, spend at other positions. Tony Pollard at RB, he's got the Texans defense. If you give up the most points to running backs, uh, I'm on raw. I'm on raw, St. Brown. Remember week one? Can we go back to week one, please? Use the money you saved on Huntley. Pay up for I'm on raw against the Vikings, 32nd ranked pass defense. And TJ Hawkinson, that's correct. I think he has himself a day against his former team. The Lions have allowed the fourth most points to tight ends this season. All right, it's Friday. Woo, woo, woo. Time to get a little PFF'd up with my friend, the co-host of the PFF NFL podcast. You're the P- you're PFF's lead NFL analyst, Sam Munson, who is here. And I didn't think I'd have a beer. But guess what? My guy Damon here in New York goes, you want a beer? Pick one. Yes. Sapporo uh, or Stella? It's got to be Stella. Stella. Okay. Okay. Why is it got to be? I, oh, no, Stella. Got it. All right. So, Just because I have no so idea. So here's the deal. Is. Listen, Richard, I've been on laughing gas all morning. Leave me alone. We're going to analyze some numbers, you and me, Sam. I love this because, honestly, I don't really set my fantasy lineups or do anything without checking in with you on some of these crazy numbers to reaffirm or teach me something new. So the first number is 99.7. That sounds like a radio station that my mom listens to in the minivan that only plays smooth jazz, some Kenny G, perhaps. What is it really? 
This is Geno Smith's PFF grade on the deep ball this year. So not only has he taken over from Russell Wilson as, you know, a really high level quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks, but he's even taken Russell Wilson's spot as the best deep passer in the NFL. 12 touchdowns, one interception on the deep ball. He is playing spectacularly, throwing a deep downfield to guys like Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf for the Seahawks. All right, Gino leads the NFL with a 72.7% completion percentage this season. He's also one win short, by the way, everybody, of matching a career high in wins, which is incredible, eight for a single season. Uh, are you like, making me drink alone in the morning on te national television? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, okay. those aren't the rules. Don't worry, don't worry. What do we got? Uh, I don't even know, something German. I, I threw out the can, huh. but. That's terrifying. <laughs> Does the job. Just drink it. All right, let's talk about it. We're getting PFF'd up here. By the way, download the PFF app. It is incredible and the easiest way to get all of these numbers and info um, that they work so freaking hard on, I can't even imagine. Uh, and that's why they need a beer on a Friday morning. The number is 314. That's the St. Louis area code. Um, and I'm going to say 314 will be my bowling score at our company holiday party. Wow. That is the number of yards that that Travis Kelsey has more than the next highest mark from a tight end. And, you know, Travis Whoa. Kelsey is like nine, 10 months younger than Gronk, who's been retired twice at this point in his career. Like we need to just take a beat and marvel at how good Travis Kelsey is at this point in his career, because he looks like he's still right in the middle of his prime at a time where most other players at that position are, are well into the, the decline. I'm looking at the total yards for Kelsey. I was checking it out uh, just before the show. He's right under 10,000. He's actually 26 yards shy of becoming just the fifth tight end in NFL history to hit that 10,000 yard mark. So cheers to you, Kelsey. And in daily fantasy, FanDuel Sport, you're always paying up for Kelsey. That 314 convinced me. You're thinking, oh, I don't want to spend the money on Kelsey and find value elsewhere. All right, the next number we have is, let's see, 38.3. I think that's the number of times a week that I ask my producer, Marissa McBride, to borrow her iPhone charger uh, before shows and then take them home with me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's actually the passer rating into J.C. Horn's coverage this season, which is the lowest in the NFL. J.C. Horn okay. has given up like 200 receiving yards in his entire career in the NFL. That guy does not give up catches and he's going up against a pair of very good wide receivers this week. That'll be some fun appointment viewing. Uh, I love J.C. Horn. They've allowed just, this is crazy, 38 points combined over the last three games. So that's pretty incredible. We have one more to go here. I don't know how I get drunk. In three, uh, three sips hit me in the morning and I haven't had breakfast and I'm good to go for the day. Um, the I, need laughing, to, I need to strap a GoPro to my forehead and see what happens to me in New York City this this uh, this Friday. Okay, we've got 25.3%, this is a percentage. 25.3%, um, this is the percentage chance that Carbone actually calls me and says, you have your reservation for three tonight. <laughs> this is Miles Garrett's pass rush win rate this season, which is the highest in the NFL at any position. Right now, Defensive Player of the Year looks like a two horse race between Micah Parsons and Nick Bosa. I don't understand why Miles Garrett isn't in that conversation as well, other than the fact that the Browns have a bad team and a bad defense, which is not Miles Garrett's fault. Okay, so Miles Garrett is, I think, a big part of this kryptonite problem with Joey Burrow, him specifically, not the offensive line. Or, I mean, he has nine sacks in eight career games against Cincinnati. He's the guy, and the Browns, by the way, seven and one in those contests. What? How do you think this shakes out, knowing the numbers, all the analysis, this week, browns Bengals. Yeah, it's tough. I, I don't think that there's anything really there to the idea that the Browns just have the, the Bengals number. I think that's more um, noise than it is signal, but it's something they have to get over. Joe Burrow hasn't beaten the Cleveland Browns in his entire NFL career for a guy as good as he is and uh, that's crazy. Like, they need to go out there and show yeah. that they're a better team, just like they did last week. Sam, what's one thing that's surprising you this season? Like, you guys have the numbers before preseason. You're talking, like, Eagles offensive line. You guys were all over all that. What, what's one thing that sort of um, surprised you so far? I mean, obviously, the Geno Smith thing. Him not just being okay, being viable at quarterback for Seattle, but being one of the better quarterbacks in the league and really – like they're going to have a tough decision this offseason because they're going to have that high draft pick, and yet Geno Smith has played so well for them. 
Yeah, and Seahawks uh, welcome the San Francisco 49ers and Mr. Purdy to town next Thursday. Excited about that. Okay, I just put the Sapporo in my hand that isn't even open. Thank you so much, Sam Munson. We love you on the show. Uh, you can catch all of Sam's hard work and everybody over at PFF.com and the new PFF app. And we will see you next week for another beer in another city because now I know that green screens, I can go anywhere. Oh, <gasps> look at this. It's a green beer. Wow. Wait. Magic. Hold on. You can't see the beer. <laughs> Why am I amused by that? No, no one else thinks that's cool. <laughs> this is great. Coming up next. The ball moving, let's get it. Six picks. As a rookie. Merry Christmas, you rookie animals. I feel great. That was the best game we played all year, Joe. Anytime you get to 10 wins in this league, you give it up for yourself. Got a long way to go here, and we still got everything in front of us. This win is fun. Let's keep this thing going. What do we say, Dolph? They gotta play us! Keep the most important thing the most important thing. Bikes on three, one, two, three, bikes! Drop the mic. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm getting so sad about <laughs> K-Makers. Hold on, I need some water. Stella went down the wrong pipe. Okay, this is gonna go on Twitter. Calm down, Richard, it's all fine. Okay, if you need to find a player that's going to get in the end zone, I've been stewing on this all week. Here we go, my K-makers. Here's who I think will score a touchdown and has a great chance to this week. How about Zeke Elliott? Okay, you might think, Wah. He has scored four touchdowns in three games since returning from injury. They've got the Texans on the dock at Battle of Texas. And the Texans have allowed a league-leading 16, 16 touchdowns to running backs this year. I got a good feeling. How about T. Higgins? T. Higgins, oh, we love him. We celebrate him on the show, and he has found the end zone in back-to-back -back weeks, and I do think he does it again against Cleveland. With all the attention they're going to pay to Jamar Chase, who had just under 100 yards in his first game back, I do think T. is going to have a touchdown in this one. And then, I know it's a migraine. I know it's a avoid at all costs the Patriots backfield kind of a thing of the past you can trust Ramondre Stevenson he leads the Patriots he's got five touchdowns this year he's going against a Cardinals defense that allowed the second most points per game in the NFL this year I like how it's adding up and how it's sort of shaping for a guy that has been the driving force of this entire New England offense hey Matt Patricia I know Mac is yelling at you on the sideline, but why don't you just give the ball to Ramondre and everyone will be happy. Zeke Elliott, Ramondre Stevenson, that's right. Two calls at running back for touchdowns and T. Higgins. All right, so many good matchups this weekend. Ravens, Steelers, oh, Eagles, Giants, Dolphins, Chargers. Playoffs on the line. So we'll preview the week 14 slate after this. Let's take that. Week 14 slate is here. Little NFC East action, we love it. We got a battle of Texas. How about this? Okay, Mike F and White going up to Buffalo to take on Allen and company. Um, what else do I love? I mean, Dolphins at Chargers is a great one as well. The weekend after that is uh, Titans at Chargers, which we're excited about. It is time for some Friday. Take that. Derek, put me on camera. Is this Derek's last show, Richard? <coughs> Derek, our uh, director, it is his last show. He's been filling in and helping us out for Sarushi, who's been in Qatar uh, covering the World Cup. So, Derek, you've done an incredible job. You've made improvements to our show. And I just want to take a quick thank you for you as we get into some thoughts over the weekend. You are welcome, Derek. All right, let's get into this. Uh, this is called Take That! Things that we think. How about the NFC East? Let's go. Philly at Washington. And I want to start with those 11-1 Eagles taking on those 7-4. and four. I roll and won Giants in the Meadowlands. I said last week that the game against the Commanders was the most meaningful, most impactful, pitiful, uh, pitiful, pivotal, not pitiful, but, you know, biggest start of Daniel Jones' career. Uh, the results weren't pitiful, but they weren't great either. It was sort of inconclusive and as inconclusive as it could possibly get with a tie. And that tie raised the stakes even more for this one. The Giants, they need a win so bad. Hamilton, as we bring him onto the show here for a second, they need a win to keep these playoff hopes alive. So, Les, I love Eli hanging out with Pete Davidson and they're doing all this stuff, but this is about the Giants and the Eagles. They, I mean, what they've done in the last five games, not good enough. So if you're Daniel Jones, you don't want your legacy against the Eagles to be, I'm going to show it. I'm going to show it. Ha! 
Hamilton, I'm gonna show it. Oh, here he is, this, where he's going and you're so excited and everyone's on their couches. I'm jumping, the popcorn's flying everywhere. He's gonna go all the... Wow, wow. That's like me trying to get into Carbone tonight. That's like me trying to <laughs> run into the door and then it's like, Arr! I feel like that might be you trying to walk out of that studio after the laughing gas and beer interaction. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think the feeling here in New York, because remember also for Daniel Jones, this is a contract year for him and he's trying to prove he can be the franchise quarterback for the Giants. So I think this is a game, you know, I know the Eagles are 11 and one, but this is Giants Eagles. These Giants fans, I think, are expecting a win and this team to rise to the occasion and, you know, finally, you know, pick up some steam after hitting a rough spot here in the middle of the season. Uh, well said. I noticed that you changed, which only means one thing. Andrew Whitworth is, in fact, Regina George and got you to change the way you dress like she did all those girls in the high school when they had the little cutouts in their t shirts. Yeah, I mean, getting the, the just okay out of him, like, if you're saying to someone on TV, just okay uh, about the look, that says everything you need to know. Yeah. I mean, that was him being polite. So just imagine yeah. how he really felt. So you went and changed into the Sean O'Hara classic, because Sean O'Hara yeah. would never tell you that. Exactly. Sean O'Hara will always support me with the quarter zip. You got the quarter zip, the uh, Kirkland brand quarter zip, and we love to see it. I want to go to the yep. AFC East. It's the New York Jets at Buffalo, so we'll stay there. The Jets are traveling. It's, you know, Buffalo got vaulted back up into the one seed. Nobody had a better Sunday than them. They didn't even play. Uh, the Bengals went over the Chiefs. That was good. But it really wasn't all good news this week because we did find out that Von Miller does have a torn ACL. He's going to miss the rest of their season, their big ticket, their Super Bowl piece, uh, uh, and this is a pretty significant speed bump in their, you know, desire to win a Super Bowl. Um, I'm going to say this. I think the Bills have a little something to prove right now. Remember what happened in the first meeting with the Jets. And take a look at this. New York beat Josh Allen up just a little bit, right? They picked him off twice. They sacked him five times, including the one uh -huh. that caused his elbow injury. So Buffalo yeah. has to take care of business, because. Hamilton, before they start thinking Super Bowl. they got to take care of business in their division. Yeah, they really do because, uh, you know, losing those games to the Jets and Dolphins puts them in a little bit of a weird spot. And, uh, yeah, I think this Jets defense, we talk so much about the Niners and how great the Niners defense is. Over the past eight or nine weeks, the Jets are the number two defense in the NFL. They're right up there with the Niners. They've been playing phenomenal football as well. Robert Sala obviously had hands on, on both of those units, so it's pretty incredible to see. Um you know, the imprint that he's left on this league. But this just defense is for real. And for the Bills, it's a challenge to show, hey, our offense can get it going against one of these top defenses in the league. And I know, you know, you look at it like if you're a Bills fan, the Jets have been kind of your little brother over these last couple of years, but they did beat you. And I think, um, you know, solving them and showing that that was, you know, they can kind of show that was an anomaly and that they're still, they still hold the upper hand over the Jets and over everybody else in the AFC East. So we know the Bills fans and this Bills team, I feel like they're always at their best when they have a little chip on their shoulder, when they feel like they have something to prove. I don't think they like being in that position of like, oh, they're the odds on Super Bowl favorite. Everybody's picking them to win. I think they like now that people are going to start doubting them a little bit, especially without Von Miller in there. That's a good point, and they have the chance to sort of prove doubters wrong because they've got back-to-back -back revenge game situations, of course, first up against the Jets and then the Dolphins right after, so exciting stuff in the AFC East. Uh, finally, let's go to Tom Brady, Tampa Bay at San Francisco. We like the storylines here. Let's look at Tom Brady's return to the Bay. Not, not like he played there, but he's obviously from there. It's a cute storyline, and he takes on Brock Purdy and the Niners. I do think the jury's still out on both of these teams and how they stack up in the NFC as we sort of gain knowledge and g gain focus on the playoff picture. And we're going to get legitimate, hopefully, solid, don't tie, please, legitimate answers on Sunday. Uh, and the questions are, you know, will that miraculous comeback from Tampa jolt the Bolts back into being the team that we know they have the talent to be? And on the other side, can Brock Purdy build off his impressive outing against the Dolphins, against a defense that has a full week to prepare for him. So he's become uh, Hamilton sort of one of the most intriguing figures in the league down the
the stretch because his team's absolutely loaded and Super Bowl bound if he and Shanahan can work it out and stay in contention. And then Trent Williams, of course, uh, I know you saw this, he added fuel to that intrigue this week, joining a podcast for The Athletic, and he had this to say about the competitive nature Purdy has brought to the team since he stepped in. I'd be like, man, just relax, man. This is scout team reps. But then again, you understand that how he got to this point. It's his makeup, you know. And, and uh, for us to have, you know, I think pay what Subfield a pretty penny yep. to yep. to be the, to be the backup, and for a guy to come in and impress the coaching staff as much as he did to unseat a guy who was basically paid to be in that position. You know, I think it speaks, it speaks to, to what everybody's seen. High praise from one of the best, if not the best in the game right now, a future Hall of Fame tackle. So we really have no idea how it's going to actually play out with Purdy when live bullets are flying, but I want to make sure I say this before anything else happens, okay? If Purdy winds up being successful, can we collectively not turn it into some type of slight about Jimmy G. Hear me out. Brock could end up being a good quarterback and take the team very far. It doesn't mean that suddenly Jimmy is, was, will be terrible. Why can't they both be good? Probably because networks and things need ratings and they need to discuss and pick things apart. But the truth is, the actual truth is that success, and this is something I've learned, success is not mutually exclusive. It doesn't have to become some weird media war with people using Purdy as a way to justify unwarranted opinions about Garoppolo. A 42-19 and 19 record should shut everyone up. It's enough of a sample size in this league to show us Jimmy is a good, great quarterback. And I know it'll happen regardless, and I'm wasting my breath here because it's the culture that we live in right now. But I did want to put it out there because maybe someone will listen to me, and if one person does, it'll be enough for me. Uh, the success of one player, to use that to tear down another one, is something that will always drive me crazy, Hamilton. I couldn't have said it any better myself, Kay. I love that. I know you've been such a big supporter of Jimmy uh, over the years. And it. you're right. Like uh, I'm intrigued by Purdy. I'm excited about Purdy. I want to see what this kid has. But, yeah, there is that apprehension. It's like, oh, God, here we go. People are going to have their Jimmy hot takes now. So um, let Purdy's be success be Purdy's success. I told you Monday how we frame it's important because they're going to tear down Jimmy by us saying good things about Purdy, and we saw that happen this week. We will see you guys on Monday, wherever it will be. I don't know. I don't have a flight home. Bye.